releasing the past. And, you know, this is something that we have to consciously do. And we can do it. And, you know, at this time of the year, um, we've just celebrated the birth of our Savior. We've just celebrated the birth of Jesus. And along with it, we're celebrating the new life that he gave us. Amen? And now we're about to celebrate this in this new year, the start of of everything new. Fresh starts, new beginnings, amen? Clean slates. But what the Lord was putting on my heart is that before we can begin something new, we need to release the old, amen? Why carry last year's bad baggage into a new start, a new year, and why bring it with you? There are things in every one of our lives that occurred in 2015 that are better off left behind. Amen? Amen. Amen. Friends, we, we, we must not be reluctant to release the mistakes of our past. Hmm? And we must not be reluctant to release the fears of our past. We, we can't be reluctant to, to release the hurts of our past. We can't be reluctant to, to release the regrets of our past. Friends, these all serve as barriers They'll prevent you from moving forward with your life. They they hinder, they distract, they turn you to the right, they turn you to the left. They're they're that ball and chain. Amen? And and God says you've got to let those things in your past go. If he has forgiven and forgotten, my goodness, how we need to, to share that same compassion for ourselves. They keep you locked into yesterday. They steal the opportunities of today and they steal the hopes of tomorrow. You know, I remember once seeing a news clip of a man stranded on the ledge of a burning building. It was in a big city somewhere. You know, they have those ledges outside. And this guy was holding on to a drain pipe or something on that ledge, and this building was blazing. And they raised up one of those huge aerial ladders to try to rescue him. And the fireman atop the ladder was was calling out to the man, reaching for the man, but the man was too afraid to let go. He was holding on to this one piece of this crumbling building, and that was his only hope. His rescuer is shouting to him, let go! Let go! And he's reaching out to him. And the man made one frantic lunge, grabbed the hand of the fireman who pulled him onto the ladder to safety, And within minutes, before the man got to the ground, that section of wall collapsed. Friends, that man was saved by making the right decision at the very last moment. (laughs) Why do we do that to ourselves? The man's reluctance to seize the opportunity to be rescued nearly cost him his life. He he needed to overcome the desire to hold on to what used to provide security. You know, in our lives, we 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 as we pass through, we discover these things that we think are little bastions of security, only to find out there's no security except in God. Everything else passes away. Friends betray us. 
Relationships are so deceptive sometimes. They're just not what you think they are. You're relying. Listen, it's like, it's, it's like trying to stand firm on quicksand. But Jesus, church, is the rock. We need to seize every opportunity that he places before us. Such reluctance to reach out for the the new and the better is is more common than, than you might realize. And it reminds me of a Christian joke. But the reality of it really isn't funny. And I'm going to share it with you. It's, it's called God Will Save Me. And it says, a terrible storm came into a town and local officials sent out an emergency warning that the riverbanks would soon overflow and flood the nearby homes. They ordered everyone in the town to evacuate immediately. A faithful Christian man heard the warning and decided to stay, saying to himself, I'll trust God, and if I'm in danger, then God will send a divine miracle to save me. Neighbors came by his house and said, we're leaving and there's room for you in our car. Please come with us. But the man declined. I have faith in God. He'll save me. As the man stood on his porch watching the water rise up the steps, a man in a canoe paddled by and called out to him, Hurry and come into my canoe. The waters are rising quickly. But the man again said, No thanks. God will save me. The floodwaters rose higher pouring water into his living room, and the man had to retreat to the second floor. A police motorboat came by and saw him at the window. We'll come up and rescue you, they shouted. But the man refused, waving them off, saying, use your time to save someone else. I have faith that God will save me. The floodwaters rose higher and higher, and the man had to climb up onto his rooftop A helicopter spotted him and dropped a rope ladder. A rescue officer came down the ladder and pleaded with the man, grab my hand and I'll pull you up. But the man still refused, folding his arms tightly to his body. No, thank you. God will save me. Shortly after, the house broke up and a floodwater swept the man away and he drowned. When in heaven the man stood before God and asked, I put all my faith in you. Why didn't you come and save me? And God said, son, I gave you a warning. I sent you a car. I sent a canoe. Then I sent you a motorboat. I sent you a helicopter. What more were you looking for? (laughs) Church, today, this world that we're living in, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's, It's just an especially dangerous and treacherous place. We need to realize how desperately this world needs God. And we need to realize how desperately God is trying to reach this world. He sent a warning. He sent a canoe. You know, all the times that God has done all these things for us, have we really reached back? Sometimes maybe yes, sometimes maybe no. How many times have we decided we can do it ourselves? I can handle this. Every time I hear that, I cringe. Friends, with everything that's going on, this terrorism sweeping the globe, and it is, it's in Africa, it's in the Middle East, in Europe, and it's even here in the relative safety and security of our United States. Friends, sin and godlessness are running rampant, but in the midst of it all, God sent us a warning. And he sent us a car. 
He sent us a canoe, a motorboat, a helicopter, and it was all wrapped up in one little baby in a manger. Amen? And just as with the man in the flood, the Savior didn't necessarily come the way man expected to find him. If we want to move forward in Christ, church, we must release the past. We don't want to be held back by where you've been and what you've done. Friends, we we need the faith to let go of the world. Let go of its ways. Let go of our attachments to it and grasp that hand of Jesus. Friends, we have to let go of the mistakes of yesterday. Because you can relive something a thousand times and change nothing. Reliving it changes nothing. We have to let go of the fears from our past. Because those fears are nothing more and nothing less than unreasonable expectancies that your enemy is greater than your God. Otherwise, what would you fear? The word says of Job, that which he greatly feared came upon him. Well, you know what that means? That means that he had greater reverence, greater respect for the enemy's ability to harm him than for God's ability to protect him. Listen, I hope you're hearing this. And and I hope this is going to stir your faith a little bit to really trust God. Everything else is going to pass away. There's there's nothing solid. There's nothing reliable. There is no rock but Jesus. There's no solid place to stand but on Jesus. There's no better place to place your feet than squarely on that rock. We've got to let go of these fears. Isaiah 54, I'm going to read verses 13 and 14 to you from the Amplified. And it says, And all your spiritual children shall be disciples, taught by the Lord and obedient to his will. And great shall be the peace. Say this with me. Say, great Great shall be be my my peace. Oh, praise God. It says, great shall be the peace and the undisturbed composure of your children. God is promising you that your composure can remain undisturbed. Verse 14, you shall establish yourself in righteousness, which means rightness and what you in conformity to God's uh, will and order, you shall be far from even the thought of oppression or destruction, listen to these next words, for you shall not fear. Say, I shall not fear. fear. And this says that you'll be kept far from terror, for it shall not come near you. Friends, what have we to fear? Nothing. We have nothing to fear. Friends, we, we need to let go of past hurts. People do stuff to other people, and it hurts. People can be so cruel and heartless. This is why we can't place our trust and our hope in people. Because as much as they might like you, as much as they might even love you, they're people. They're fallible. And at some point in time, they will let you down. But God will never leave you, leave you, nor forsake you. Do you hear what I just said? He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. We've got to let go of past hurts. The reluctance to let the hurts go, reluctance to move on and get over it, can and will eat away at you. 
You keep playing it again and again and again over and over in your head, and that's when you're coming up with all this stuff, I should have done this, I should have said this. No, you should have just let it go. Because playing it over and over and over again in your head will accomplish absolutely nothing. Listen, the Apostle Paul was attacked and opposed by so many. But he gave it to God and he moved on. Listen to this from 2 Timothy 4, verses 14 and 15 in the Amplified. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me great wrongs. Great wrongs. He didn't just do him a little wrong. <coughs> it says that he did him great wrongs. He says, the Lord will pay him back for his actions. He didn't say, I'm going to kill this guy. He didn't say, I'm going to get even with him. I would venture to say he didn't even lose sleep over it. He gave it to the Lord. And in verse 15, then he warned others and cautioned them not to go to the same place because we might not all have that same level of faith where we can release the past. He said, beware of him yourself. For he opposed and resisted our message very strongly and exceedingly. This guy hated Christians. He hated them of the way. He hated the message. He hated the Jesus that they preached. And he withstood him strongly. Amen. Friends, <clears throat> we all then have to release the regrets of our past. You know, the shoulda, woulda, coulda mentality. Shoulda done this, woulda done that, coulda done this. All right, so maybe you didn't. So what? You see, what you shoulda, coulda, woulda done in your past only matters if you're still living in your past. Otherwise, you should have moved on from it already. And now it's, what can God do for me? What can I do for God? How can he bless me? How can I serve him in the now? Yeah. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Yeah. Not yesterday's faith. Yeah. Today's miracles, today's blessings aren't dependent upon yesterday's faith. Right. You all with me? Friends, there's always today, and there's always tomorrow, if your past doesn't keep you from it. Looking back cost Lot's wife very dearly. Jesus himself said that no man is fit for the kingdom if he puts his hands to the plow and keeps looking back. Forget about what's back there. Most of us made enough blunders in the past that we should be happy to get out of there. I know I did. Friends, let's not allow the past to rob us of a wonder-filled today and a future full of God's very best. I'm going to share again some words from the Apostle Paul. You know, I can't help but think of the Apostle Paul when I'm sharing a message like this because God gave him a revelation that he gave no one else. And we'll get, we'll get into that more in the coming minutes before I close. Philippians 3, verses 4 through 14 in the NIV. says, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. So Paul's saying, <clears throat> he's about to tell you all the reasons why he could have confidence in his flesh. He says, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, 
faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Those things might have been pluses in the past. They might have been positive. They might have been something for me to hang my hat on, as they say. But now they're nothing. Verse 8, what's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. And be found, listen, in him. It's not enough to know him. It's not enough to simply know him. But the term in him refers to being relationally connected with him. Even the devil knows there is a Jesus, but he's not relationally connected to him. You see, it's when we surrender our hearts to his lordship, surrender our lives to his leading and guiding. Huh? This is when we become in Christ. And that's what this word is speaking of. He says in verse 9, he wants to be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. I don't want a righteousness that I've earned. But that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. It's not enough to know that there is a Christ. Paul says, I want to know him. I, I want to have an intimate relationship with him. I want to know what he loves, what he hates, what pleases him, what displeases him. He says, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. This doesn't mean that you've got to suffer all over again. This means that you need to recognize, acknowledge, and appreciate the suffering he's already done on your behalf. He says, and somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Friends, this point right here was Paul's transition point. Amen? This is where he released the past, released all his thoughts of, what I did, huh? And embraced his today and his tomorrow, his future as a new creation, as a new man in Christ. He released the past. Friends, that's exactly what we need to do. We need to release our past. Verse 12, he says, this is where it really gets pertinent. He says, not that I have already obtained this. Obtained what? Righteousness, right standing with God. He says, I haven't already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Listen, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, there's one thing that I know I got to do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Forget about the past. We've all blown it in the past. 
But we can't let yesterday's mistakes determine the outcome. Are you hearing me? It's like the etcher sketch. Yeah, come on, give him some praise in this place. It's like the etch -a sketch when, when it gets all messed up from turning those knobs. You don't take it and throw it away. All you got to do is give it a little shake. The screen is cleared and you get a fresh start. Friends, that's where you are right now. Fresh start time. Let go of the things of the past. Yes, you made mistakes. So did I. So what? God is faithful and just to forgive us. This is what Jesus went to a cross for. He didn't come to save the well. He came to save the sin sick. That was me. That was you at one time. But we're not sick anymore. Forgetting what is behind. Forget about it. Friends, our past can no longer be permitted to define us. I still love when every once in a while somebody will see me on TV and they're like, what? Brower? <laughs> Preaching? They remember me when I was the heathen of all heathens. <laughs> they remember me as a drunk, as a drug addict, as a rowdy. They say, what are you, got to be kidding? And I say, that right there is the testimony. There's the living proof right there. I'm not who I was. I'm not what I once was. And what I am today is who I really was all along. But I've let go of my past. It doesn't hold me back anymore. It's not defining me anymore. I'm living with a whole new definition. I'm no longer defined by my past. Friends, you are not who you once were. You are not what you once were. But from now on, you are who and what God has called you to be and predestined you to be. Listen, yeah, praise God. This isn't an accident. What God has called you to be, this isn't an accident. God says, I have plans for you. Plans include beginning, the middle, and the end. God knows the end from the beginning. And you'll get there if only you'll let go of every distraction and every hindrance and everything that would turn you to the right and to the left. Release those things. Let go of your past. Ephesians 2 and 10 in the Amplified, listen to this. For we are God's own handiwork. His workmanship. Now listen to this. It doesn't say created in Christ. It says recreated in Christ. Recreated. God recreated you. When? When you wanted to be recreated. When you, when you submitted to his will to recreate you. Because that's why, and the only reason why you are not what you once were, and you're not who you once were, you've been recreated. God shook, shook that thing. What was it called? Edge of sketch. And started all over. And, and this time he made something wonderful of you. Oh, praise God. Now listen. It says that we were recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined. It says planned beforehand.